think, a very strong argument to be made that pharmaceutical companies have somewhat of a vested interest in uh, making people sick. So no, I think the whole conception is insane. Do you think that the declining birth rates are an existential problem to our way of life? I have to say, who cares? The who cares mentality. Well, I mean, there are going to be further generations, so we do have to think about those guys. That is pretty arrogant to expect to know what's going to happen two generations out, three generations out. The idea that parents should have kids out of a sense of duty is one way to see birth rates decline. No, yeah, yeah. immigration doesn't embrace multiculturalism. If you get mass amounts of immigration from other cultures, then these cultures, as much as we would like them to leave it at the door and as much as we could try and legislate that, a lot of the times they don't leave it at the door. And we're seeing this. The problem is not their culture. There's no political leadership out there. I mean, and the Republicans, I preferred Nikki Haley to the rest of them, but- Do you think that uh, Nikki Haley is smarter than Vivek Ramaswamy? Uh, Yaron Brook, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you uh, making some time for the Reality Based Podcast. My pleasure. Absolutely. So one of the reasons why I love listening to your channel and listening to your commentary is you're such a staunch defender of capitalism. And in this day and age, I feel like that's becoming more and more important because I'm not sure if this is something that you've observed, but when I look around at the current climate, I see a lot of people who are veering away from the ideas of capitalism because maybe they're seeing some of the ills of culture and society and politics and and they're they're looking at capitalism as maybe the problem in regards to this so do you think that people in the west are moving away from capitalism and, and if so why do you think that's happening absolutely i i think that uh the people who used to defend capitalism people who we have, uh, have associated in the past with the kind of political right uh, the left has always been anti-capitalist. Uh, the people in the political right have veered away from capitalism. Uh, they, they, they veered towards various forms of uh, statism, uh, primarily towards various forms of, uh, I call it economic fascism, uh, where, where the state controls. I, I, I think it's, I think it, this has many reasons. I think partially it has to do with the fact that they associated the world in which we live today with capitalism and therefore they associate all the ills of capitalism, uh, all the ills of the world we have today with capitalism. Um, and uh, they also have misdiagnosed a lot of the problems. So uh, they, they blame globalization, they blame uh, uh, international trade for a lot of things that have nothing to do with globalization, international trade. So there's a lot of misdiagnosis. Uh, but then there's also the, the reality that capitalism is a Capitalism is a very demanding system. <laughs> it demands the best of individuals. It demands you to actually live up to your potential as a human being. It demands you to be rational and work hard and, and engage. And, and I think there's a lot of, the, the, there's a general movement in our culture that's anti-reason, anti-rationality, emotionalist. Capitalism is also a system that places a lot of responsibility on the individual. Your life is yours. You've got to make whatever you make of it. It, nobody else can do it for you. And there is a general move in our culture broadly towards collectivism. That is uh, towards negation of individualism and individual responsibility and the idea of collective responsibility, whatever that means. Uh, so both left and right have become more entrenched in their collectivism and more entrenched in the anti-reason view. And the number of people defending capitalism, even in its more you know, moderate forms, call it, or, or even the partial capitalism that we have today, that number is definitely shrinking and, uh, and, and they seem to be getting less and less uh, visibility in the culture. And everybody seems obsessed with the cultural issues uh, and uh, everybody, in a sense, takes for granted uh, the economics and, and if anything, they take for granted the wealth and therefore they're just more concerned about how the wealth is redistributed not how the wealth is actually made. Correct, correct. So one of the big problems that I've seen over the recent years, and you look at the pandemic, um, people would look at that and they would say that there was big pharmaceutical companies that had a vested interest in promoting a, a vaccine that wasn't necessarily healthy for people. And that there was also, uh, I think, a very strong argument to be made that pharmaceutical companies have somewhat of a vested interest in uh, making people sick so that they're living off them for, for the rest of their lives, basically. And this is just one example of, I think that there are many different examples of companies that have vested interests in 
cr promoting an agenda that isn't necessarily beneficial for society and for the individual. So do you think that this is a byproduct of capitalism and, and how, do we, how do we fight this issue? No, I think the whole conception is insane. I mean, that would be like farmers have an interest in people being hungry. So let's create hunger so that we can sell them more food. Uh, I mean, that's ridiculous. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are competing. They're competing to try to make people healthier. And that competition results, the result of that competition is constant innovation in healthcare that makes us healthier. And the reality is that the vaccines were a massive boon uh, and saved a lot of lives. Uh, it saved a huge number of lives uh, on, on a global scale. Now, there was a lot of misinformation. There was a lot of incompetence and certainly by the political class and by our governments, particularly with regard to lockdowns, uh, you know, mandates, all kinds of mandates, uh, which are clear violation of rights. And and uh, and, and also, you know, all kind of uh, uh, guarantees that, you know, for for against liability that wouldn't exist in a, in a truly capitalist economy. But to blame pharmaceuticals or business for this, I mean, is is. Uh, is ludicrous. Um, it, you know, look at look at what's uh, you know the 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 drug right now that's coming out uh, uh, that is dealing with obesity and and allowing people who are obese to lose uh, weight dramatically, and at the same time is uh, massively improving uh, improving heart disease. I mean, you would think that that drug would be suppressed by the pharmaceutical companies if they if they benefited from us being sick. I mean, it's just. I mean, why do we even have penicillin? We shouldn't have penicillin because we should want people to be sick so we can sell them, uh, you know, uh, magical formulas to try to, to try to cure them and make a lot of money off of it. I, I find the attack on the pharmaceutical industry of all the industries in the world the most ludicrous and in some ways the most unjust that I can think of. Uh, you know, life expectancy today is well into the 80s in most advanced countries and in, in unadvanced countries that is well into the 70s in, in third world countries, to a large extent because of pharmaceutical companies. You know, they've improved the quality of life, the length of life. Uh, you know, so many people are taking them. And, and if, you, if you take your pharmaceuticals seriously, you can pretty much eliminate heart disease. Uh, you know, there's so many, the, the treatments, the new treatments that on a daily basis are being announced uh, to deal with cancer and, and the, the survivability from getting cancer is going way up. It, it's just a. It's it just. It's just sad that this is again kind of the misinformation, perversion, and distortion. Competitive markets lead pharmaceuticals to come up with new drugs constantly that are improving human life. And when a drug is found not to do that, it it it, it does not make it on the market. If anything, the problem that we have today is too much regulation. The, uh, you know, an FDA that's way too powerful that it makes it way too expensive to bring drugs to market, and that actually uh, takes drugs off the market that have enormous benefits to some people, but might have some side effects to a few. Uh, so we have too few drugs, we have too, free, too few freedoms, and uh, it, I wish the pharmaceutical business was much freer, less regulated, uh, and, and uh, freer to, to provide uh, a, a, even a wider variety of drugs and medicines for all of us. I think if we didn't have the amount of regulations we have today, I think it, it is not outrageous to think that life expectancy in the West could rise to 120 uh, within, a, within a couple of decades if, if you got rid of the regulations. I mean, the scientific breakthroughs are amazing. And stunningly, I know this is shocking, the pharmaceutical industry is 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 primarily composed of scientists who are trying to better human life. The idea that the pharmaceutical industry is is filled with megalomaniac, uh, you know, evil doers from James Bond movie, you know, conspiring to make people sick, is 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 bizarre at best. Okay, interesting. So, do you think that there is an an issue with crony capitalism in the West? And can you could you pinpoint any of those? Sure, there's lots of crony capitalism. There's crony capitalism all over the place. There's, there's, uh, you know, there's probably not enough competition in the pharmaceutical industry because uh, the pharmaceutical companies probably lobby to have some regulations on themselves that keep out competitors. Because if you're big, then uh, you can deal with the regulations, and if you're small, you can't. Our financial industry is rife with regulations. Some of them uh, a result of cronyism. Uh, where financial institutions have lobbied in order to protect themselves. 
uh, you know, the, the, this cronyism pretty much in every industry. I mean, look at the tariffs that uh, that Trump put in place and that Biden has kept in place. That is pure cronyism. In this case, it's cronyism by the unions. Don't forget unions are also crony actors. And it's cronyism by the steel manufacturers versus the attempted cronyism by others. So, yeah, I mean, there's a, a gazillion elements of cronyism in the marketplace. There's nothing unique about uh, about pharmaceuticals. And pharmaceuticals are, are nowhere near the worst of this. There's many, many industries that are worse. Steel manufacturers, for example, are much worse uh, than that. Look at the fact that in the United States right now, uh, the Japanese company, uh, Nippon, is trying to buy U.S. steel, and the Biden administration is going to try to stop them, and uh, Trump has said he would stop them. And uh, that's pure cronyism by unions and by an American steel company that would like to get a deal in U.S. steel and doesn't want to compete with the Japanese. So it's everywhere. But cronyism is not a result of capitalism. The more capitalism you have, the less cronyism there is. Cronyism is a result of statism. When the state is allowed to regulate, you've given the state power over business. Well, of course, business is going to try to A, protect itself from the, the attack by politicians, which is constant. And then once that happens, it's going to try to manipulate the rules to get in their favor. Well, of course, that's going to happen. The only cure for cronyism is to reduce the power of government over the economy, over business, to eliminate regulations, to get them out of the way. The fewer regulations, the, the less power uh, a government has over business, the less cronyism there is. The best story on this is, uh, uh, you know, the story of Microsoft in the mid-1990s. Microsoft at the time was the largest corporation in the world, right? It was very successful, incredibly successful. And... Uh, uh, you know, it was invited to Congress it, it, it to, uh, uh, to in front of a committee in Congress uh, run by a Republican, not a Democrat, a Republican. And it had to explain why it didn't do any lobbying in Washington, because at the time, uh, Microsoft's budget for lobbying was zero. It had no offices in D.C., nothing. Right. And the chairman of this committee in Congress stood up and he started yelling at the Microsoft officials. You guys better start spending money in Washington, D.C. You need to lobby here. In other words, pad my pockets, please. Uh, you need to build the building here. You need to, you need to invest in Washington. And the, the people at Microsoft said, you know what? We, we don't need you guys, right? We're the biggest company in the world. You leave us alone. We will leave you alone. And they walked out, right? Six months later, the government comes knocking at Microsoft's door. We're here. Uh, 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 antitrust violation. You're offering a product for free. Bundling. Uh, we're going after you for offering a product for free, which consumers clearly benefit from. Uh, so what did Microsoft learn from that? They learned, we better spend some money in Washington, D.C. We better lobby. So today, the lobbying budget of Microsoft is tens of millions of dollars. They have a beautiful building about equal distance from the White House and the Capitol Hill that is a Microsoft building. So, uh, you know, cronyism, there is no such thing as crony capitalism. Capitalism is the negation of cronyism. Cronyism is a phenomenon where government has power over business and where business fights back. And, and in fighting back, it protects its little it, its thing. But it's only made possible by giving power to government over business. Hmm. One of the other objections that we often hear about capitalism is that the nature of capitalism is that wealth disparities just become bigger and bigger as the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So is the logical conclusion of capitalism a monopoly or a tyranny of monopolies? Well, there are two questions there, one regarding inequality and one regarding um, one regarding monopolies. So we'll take them both. Um First, with regard to wealth distribution, uh, the poor do not get poorer under capitalism. That is bizarre, right? Indeed, capitalism is the only system in all of human history that has brought people out of poverty. Before capitalism, everybody was poor. 95, 96% of the human population on planet Earth was below uh, what the UN defines as extreme poverty. Today, because of capitalism, 100% because of capitalism, uh, only 8% of the world population is, and most of that is in Africa, is uh, in, is considered extremely poor in, in extreme poverty. So, uh, no, capitalism is the only system in human history that has raised people out of poverty. Now, it is true that capitalism increases inequality. 
when people um, when there's no capitalism and, and you can look at Venezuela right now, you can look at North Korea, uh, you can look at, at pretty much any place in the world with no capitalism. Uh, what you have is relative equality. Everybody is poor. And if you want to be equal, cool. Everybody has to be poor. That's what equality generates. Hmm. So but what capitalism I'll, does yeah. is it makes everybody richer, but some people richer than others. So what? Who cares, right? If some people get richer than us, indeed, the fact that some people get richer than us is, is what enables the poor to get richer. That is, it is the, the people who are speeding ahead in terms of inequality. They're the ones who are creating the wealth that helps the poor rise up from extreme poverty. So relative poverty is always there, but absolute poverty shrinks dramatically. Hmm. One of the things that I found most fascinating in my travels is going to South Korea. And when we got there, it's amazing. The technology in South Korea, uh, the amount of wealth and prosperity that they have for an Asian country, considering that in the, I think in the 1950s, they were one of the poorest countries in the entire world. Yep. And the difference between them and North Korea, apparently you can see it from space. I'm not 100% sure that that's true. But the difference between them and North Korea is just completely and utterly day and night, literally. So, um, why do you think it is that South Korea is so much richer than North Korea? So first, you can absolutely see it from space. You can, you can see these satellite photographs at night, and North Korea, the whole place is dark. There's barely any lights. And South Korea, particularly around Seoul, but other parts of South Korea, all lit up, right? So half of the peninsula is all lit up. Half of the peninsula is completely dark. Um, and the reason is simple. South Korea has embraced markets, not pure markets, not capitalism the way I would want it, but some capitalism, some freedom, property rights, respect, uh, uh, protections, uh, contracts, respect contracts. Individuals can do what they want. They can uh, pursue whatever career they want. They can consume what they want. They can live where they want. Uh, they can work as hard as they want or not. Uh, and, and of course, uh, the, the way they get paid is going to reflect that. So uh, basically, South Korea is a free country. North Korea is not. Free countries generate wealth. Unfree countries do not. Uh, so uh, South Korea is rich because it's embraced some elements of capitalism that have led uh, it towards freedom and towards wealth generation. North Korea is basically uh, socialist, authoritarian. There's no freedom, zero individual rights, zero property rights, zero contracts, and therefore it's dirt poor. Hmm. I told you before the show that I had a MAGA communist on my on my show, and I, you, I was I was familiarizing you with the idea of MAGA communism. Um, one of the ideas that these guys sort of bring across is that North Korea is actually a better place than South Korea because North Korea they're sticking it to the man, right? So North Korea are very anti imperialist and they don't succumb to the sort of global financial system. And and actually in North Korea things maybe aren't so bad. And then moving forward as we move into a post capitalist world the North Koreans would have done things right and they'll be rewarded in the end. Um, but when you do look at, at South Korea, for example, getting back to the point of monopolies, they do have a quite a monopolistic society in a way because the Kaibols, which is the big corporations in South Korea, they... Um, the, the government basically invests all of everything into the Kaibols, like Samsung and uh, I think it's Samsung, Hyundai, LG and companies like this. Do you sympathize at all with the, uh, with the MAGA communists in, in the sense that the monopoly... Uh, type system that they've got in South Korea is commodifies the people and they should be maybe sticking it to the man? It is a, the most disgusting point of view I've heard in a very long time. I mean, these are people who obviously think Stalin was a hero and, and really think Hitler was a hero. I mean, this is, this is the equivalent of what North Korea is. So they think it's okay that, you know, about every decade North Korea goes through a famine in which hundreds of thousands of people die of starvation. I mean, when was the last time the Western world has had a famine? You, you'd have to go back about 300 years or more to, to find it. Since the invention of capitalism, there's been no famines in the Western world. Indeed, even in Africa, there are very few famines because in Africa has embraced elements of capitalism and therefore there are no famines there, or, or fewer, much fewer than there used to be. North Korea, uh, because of the way it is, 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 is uh, you know, people die of starvation. Uh, these people, I mean, people in North Korea cannot think for themselves. Any idea that they present that is not approved of by the supreme leader, is they are murdered, they are killed. Uh, is this the kind of world they want to live in? You know, it, it really is sick 
that given the actual information that we have about the consequence of communism, everywhere it's tried, everywhere it's tried, in, and North Korea is a great example of it, uh, that anybody would would put communism as part of their ideology. It is an evil. It, the people themselves, uh, uh, it, it, you know, they're clearly evading reality. I consider them evil, their ideology an evil ideology, and them for holding that ideology uh, are beneath contempt. Um, yes, South Korea has certain monopolistic tendencies. That, In that sense, it's not purely capitalist. Uh, you know, it has these family-run large businesses, uh, that are very enmeshed with the government, and and uh, and that is unfortunate. I think to the extent that uh, North, South Korea does that, its economy right now, for example, is relatively stagnating. Uh, now that they're rich, I should note. Now that they don't have famines. Uh, now that people can pretty much do what they want and live the way they want to live, um, they they uh, they they are stagnating, partially because the structure of chibbles ma makes it very difficult. Uh, to continue growing once you become rich. You need uh, what, what South Korea right now needs is massive reform that takes power away from these chibbles and basically uh, uh, allows for real entrepreneurship and real innovation. And I think they'll get there. I mean, I hope they get there. Uh, South Korea is a pretty dynamic and exciting place. If you've ever been to Seoul, it's a pretty amazing place. And I, I, encourage, I encourage anybody who considers themselves a MAGA uh, communist to parachute into North Korea. I mean, it, it, or we, maybe we can help them do it. Maybe we can it, it drop them into uh, North Korea and live there a little bit. May, you know, maybe the demonstrators that you know about Gaza can can be airdropped into Gaza, and the the pro, pro North Koreans can be airdropped into North Korea. That 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 might be a solution for the West. Yeah, it's certainly. Way, uh, I, I wouldn't for for kidnapping anybody and okay. dropping them there. <laughs> Well, I mean, I certainly wouldn't be wanting to make that parachute journey myself. I think that I, I saw enough from the demilitarized zone for me to be quite content with that. Um, so another argument that is often made is that actually capitalism is good for us and it's good for the West. It's good for the rich people in the West, but it exploits the developing world and it actually just exploits the developing world for their resources, etc. And it's really bad for these countries. How would you respond to that argument? Well, again, I think it's 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 completely ridiculous. Uh, you know, African countries that have embraced elements of capitalism, Botswana, uh, Namibia, to some extent, a little bit Rwanda, uh, have uh, vastly higher GDP growth and economic growth and, and much more successful societies. Uh, Botswana uh, in particular has also a, a relatively free political system. Uh, and and is doing quite well and and uh, it, you know part of part of it is uh, so so first to the extent the poor countries embrace the capitalism they succeed look at and, and let's think again South Korea that you mentioned earlier used to be one of the poorest countries in the world it used to be poorer than North Korea now it's one of the most richest countries in the world and incredibly successful Taiwan Hong Kong Singapore Japan after World War II were all third world countries they were all very 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 poor they embraced capitalism they succeeded you could make the same case for malaysia and indonesia they're a little they haven't embraced capitalism quite as much but to the extent that they have become richer and are moving towards becoming rich countries it's because they're embracing capitalism now uh, you know th this idea of exploitation is again what exactly is being exploited uh, these countries have natural resources they don't know how to extract the natural resources. They don't know what to do with those natural resources. Indeed, the whole concept of natural resources is a perverse concept because these so-called natural resources, no, you know, until somebody discovers what to do with them and how to use them, and they're just, they're just there. They, you, know, you know that oil, up until the mid-19th century, oil, if you had oil on your property and it was oozing out of the ground, that lowered the value of the property because you couldn't grow anything on it. It was just gunk. It was horrible stuff. What, what do you do with it? And it's only once you discover how to refine it and how to use it and how to, uh, how to extract it properly and all of that does it gain value. So the fact that these poor countries have, natural, have these resources, it's only the fact that the West has a use for them that gives them value. And what the West does 
And I'm not saying in all cases, certainly there are uh, situations of exploitation, but in most cases, the West cuts a deal where we will pay you to extract this resource, but we'll pay you money you wouldn't have gotten otherwise because you have no use for these resources. Like what use does an African country have for, I don't know, uranium? They don't have any use for it. They can't do anything with it. They don't have the technology. They don't have the science. They don't know what to do with it. In, in the West, you can use it to, to make electricity. So, uh, you know, we'll extract the uranium, we'll give you, a, we'll pay you for it, and, and we'll use it uh, in, in productive ways. So, no, this is win-win where, uh, you know, where there is uh, a government on the other side that is uh, respectful, at least to some extent, of property rights. Look, all of these countries in Africa, it, it, you know, could tomorrow become significantly wealthier if they embraced freedom, if they embraced property rights, for their own people. Imagine if the people in Africa actually got, as individuals, got the right to the land that they live on, including the natural resources of that land. Then they could cut deals with Western companies or African companies or whatever. Uh, instead, uh, corrupt dictators cut the deals and they funnel mm -hmm. their money into uh, Swiss bank accounts. But the problem there is the corrupt dictators uh, mm -hmm. and, and their political system, not, uh, not capitalism. I'm interested to know, just sort of um, on the back of that, do you think that China's Belt Road Initiative and the way in which they're going about the world and sort of planting their interests everywhere, do you think that that's moral? Um, <laughs> I don't think anything China does is moral, right? Because, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it shouldn't be the Chinese government. I don't think governments should be going around the world giving loans and going around the world building infrastructure. I don't think any government should do that. I don't think the United States should be giving out foreign aid. I, I just I think it's immoral for governments to spend their own people's money on ambitions for empire or ambitions to to, to do charity or, or to, you know, uh, uh, buy influence around the world. I think all of that is immoral. I certainly think what China is doing is immoral, uh, but it's not capitalism, right? Capitalism says the government does not interfere in the economy, including the economies of other countries. It just doesn't interfere in the economy. So if private Chinese companies want to go to Sri Lanka and build the port, yay, good for them, as long as it's privately funded and, and, and it's all legit. But for the Chinese government to do it is wrong, it's immoral, and beware if you're an African or Asian country, if you're getting money from China, beware what strings come attached to that money. Hmm. Do you think that the declining birth rates in the West, I mean, we just mentioned South Korea, I think they're actually below one right now. Do you think that they are an existential problem to our way of life? <laughs> not in my lifetime, not even in your lifetime, <laughs> not in my children's lifetime, and probably not in my grandchildren's lifetime. So I have to say, who cares, right? Uh, birth rates change over time. Uh, uh, values change over time. Uh, economic and, and social conditions change over time. I'm not worried about birth rates, uh, particularly if you allow for immigration. I think the birth rate problem is particularly uh, bad and particularly problematic in economies that don't allow for immigrants, because then you get real decline in GDP and you, you could get real decline in uh, standard of living and in, in wealth creation. You just don't have enough people, particularly if you have a big welfare state and you got a bunch of people retiring and you have no young people working to pay for those retirees. Uh, so bring in young immigrants, basically as slaves, to your old population so that you can pay the welfare to your old people, which is what I think Europe has done, right? The, why do we have so many immigrants in Europe? To pay for the welfare state for aging Germans. I mean, that's that's the reason. And and the same, you know, the same goes around the world. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think that the reasons for the declining birth rate have a lot to do with a world that is very pessimistic, a world you know, if, if, you, if you grow up today uh, and you go to school today in kindergarten and in primary school and high school, uh, you, you know, you, you look like a young guy. So your generation or even younger than you, you were, you were taught from when you were very young that human beings destroy the earth, that uh, we're, 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 we're destroying the environment, that life on earth is, uh, is very precarious and uh, we're probably all going to boil to death in the future because of global warming. I mean, how, how long did Greta give us a few years ago? What was it? Eight years? I think it was eight years. Yeah. Eight years. And yeah. I think we're three years into oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> we only got five years. Why would anybody have kids 
if they if they if they buy the propaganda that we've only got five years or we've only got a generation or the world is coming to an end, why would they buy the propaganda? If 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 you really believe, if you're a mega communist and you think North Korea is really the 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 ideal society, why would anybody have kids if that's the direction we're heading? I mean, there's so much. I believe that uh, birth rates are related to optimism and pessimism. I think right now the West, in particular. And, and I think rich Asian countries as well. We just are in a morbid state of mind. I think this is because of the philosophy we hold. We, we as cultures believe that, uh, you know, we don't value ourselves. We don't value the wealth we've created. We've kind of taken it all for granted. We're afraid of the future. New, World War Three is around the corner. Uh, we know, you know, in the West, we think all our wealth was built in colonialism and exploiting other people. So, so we think we're all guilty. In that state of mind, you know, who wants to have who wants to have kids? I mean, there's also one of the things that goes along with having kids. It turns out is sex, um, and there's a what do they call it? A sex recession right now, right? People mm. are not having sex in all age groups, not having sex or a lot less. I than think the sex. bottom of the barrel, the bottom of the barrel are not. There are a lot more people stacking up at the bottom that aren't. But then it's this strange social phenomenon that as like especially women get into the workforce more and as especially women become a little bit more equal in terms of their earning capacity, they're actually going for more high status men because they tend to look upwards in terms of dating. They tend to date hypergamously. And then there are a lot more men stacking up at the bottom that are having less opportunities with women. Yeah. I, but but I, I think generally, uh, you know, I think, but it seems like, I mean, uh, the stats I've seen is that this is a phenomenon that's culture wide. That is Maybe that's also going on, but it's also true that married couples are having less sex, older married couples are having less sex. That is generally we live in a culture that's having less sex now. I Maybe view- it's something to do with porn. It could be something to do with the rise of internet yeah, porn and ha- so. being able to access your kicks elsewhere. I, I go I go back to I go back to my my hypothesis about pessimism. Sex is a celebration of life. Sex is affirmation of life. It's the sense that yes, life is worth living. This is amazing. It's the pleasure that comes from that sense of it's great to be alive. And, and sex gets better the more you have that sense about the world. And I think that if you're a pessimist, as, as our culture is overwhelming these, these days, if you're morbid, if you're you know, convinced that you know, everything's going to hell, um, you know, sex, that appetite for sex goes away. Yeah, there's you nothing, to more sex. nothing to sell. Oh, I would agree in terms of the birth rates. I just want to quiz you on a few things you said there. So your response initially to the birth rates was kind of, who cares? I'm not going to be here. My kids might not even be here. And then you said that you think that an answer could be bringing in more immigrants. To me, and tell me how I'm wrong, but this seems to me sort of uh, like something that is a system that's bound to collapse. Because if you're just bringing in immigrants, then you're encouraging multiculturalism and we sort of lose the foundation of like who we are as a country. And also the who cares mentality. Well, I mean, there are going to be further generations, so we do have to think about those guys. Don't we, they'll think about it? I mean, if if people think too far into the future, you know that is pretty arrogant, pretty arrogant to expect to know what's going to happen two generations out, three generations out. It's pretty arrogant to know what technology is going to be like. I mean, we're going to have test tube babies in the future. If we need more people, we'll just create them. I mean, who knows, right? Science fiction. The point is. The more you think out further into the future, the less you know, and the less, the more humble you should be about any conclusions you come. You have literally no idea what life on earth is going to be like in 50 years. We barely know what life is going to be like in 10 years. Nobody saw this revolution in AI coming. Nobody saw the internet before it was created. Nobody saw CRISPR gene editing and the ability. I mean, it, it just, it, so the, 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 the idea that we could, project out into the future no oh, oh we know there's going to be a problem in 50 years we should fix it now is is central planning on steroids and i think should be avoided at all costs uh, but- i think when you're talking about central planning that's a good point in terms of like governments doing these big overreaching things like when you're talking about climate change for example but it's on the individual level individuals. when it if you th- I'm not sure it is when it, when it comes to the individual level and just and just and having a family, for example, this is something that I believe is constant throughout time. And it's kind of, I guess, something that something that you might call wisdom is the fact that having a family is something that's going to be productive and building your sort of family network around you is something that is going to be good for the future because you get to, at, at the very least, have a legacy. 
I know people who are living phenomenal lives, happy life, successful life, who've never had kids, uh, you know, and, and, and never, never, you know, having a family needs to be something you really want. It has to be self-interested. It has to be something you're going to enjoy. Life is too short to think, oh, I should have a family because I'm worried about civilization in 50 years. I, you know, I, I don't give a shit about civilization in 50 years if you're going to impose a family on me today for that. Now, I have a family. I've done my thing, right, for civilization in the future. But I didn't do it because I was worried about civilization. I did it because I've always wanted to have kids. I love kids. I, I love the process. I love the challenge. I love what, what's involved in having kids. I, the idea that parents should have kids out of a sense of duty is one way to see birth rates decline. Because, uh, you know, uh, that sense of duty will disincentivize people to have it. You should have kids because it's a wonderful experience to engage in, in raising children and having children. Uh, but you asked a different question uh, before about, um, God, it, 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 oh, immigration, yes. No, yeah, yeah. immigration doesn't embrace multiculturalism. Multiculturalism is the idea that all cultures are created equal, that there's no difference between culture. Now, that idea is absolutely wrong. Western civilization has a far superior culture than any culture in all of human history. Yep. Immigration should be embraced under the assumption that every human being on planet Earth, no matter their skin color or no matter their particularly genetic makeup, has the ability to embrace Western civilization. The Western civilization is not embedded in your genes. It's not because we in the West used to be pretty barbaric. So we learned something and became better. Mm. Uh, uh, immigration is the recognition that anybody can embrace a culture. America, whether they, the MAGA like it or not, is a land of immigrants. It's a land of immigrants from all kinds of places, including places that at the time were considered barbaric and primitive and third world like Ireland and, and, uh, and Italy and Poland and East and, you know, and, and Russia. Uh, and, and there was a huge amount of racism in the 19th century against immigrants from certain parts uh, uh, of, of Europe. But, you know, Im immigration is a recognition that all human beings can embrace Western civilization and that they're welcome to embrace that civilization. And it, it, you know, it, it's true that if you allow immigrants in and say, keep your culture, we love your culture, your culture is great, then that's suicide. And that's what to a large extent Europe is doing right now, mm -hmm. particularly with its Muslim immigration is saying, no, no, Islam is fantastic. You guys can stay crazy Muslims uh, and you can come here. That's the wrong approach. The approach needs to be, you can come here. We don't care if you're Muslim otherwise, but all of that cultural stuff that you're leaving needs to be left behind. You now need to embrace Western civilization, and we will hold you to it, both in terms of language, in terms of the work requirements that you have, and uh, you know, and in terms of your behavior. If you violate our laws, you will go to jail for a very long time. We're not going to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, loose with you because you're immigrants and or because you you're from a different culture. We don't accept that all cultures are equal. That's the kind right. of immigration. I think I would like to see. And the kind of immigration used to be part of the West. And it probably should be like that and should be at scale. Uh, but when, you, when you're looking at Islamic immigration, just for an example, I'm in the UK at the moment. When you walk around London, it doesn't look like London anymore. It's because they've had such a mass amount of Islamic immigration. And unfortunately, if you have a mass Islamic immigration like that, this is a culture that believes that the whole entire world should be uh, Islamic. And, you know, a lot of them aren't extreme like that. But if you get so many of them at one point, it gets to the point now where England is actually electing heaps of different Muslim leaders. And I think that that's a huge problem. So just in terms of immigration and the birth rates, I think that encouraging the family and encouraging the birth rates within your culture is so much more productive than encouraging mass amounts of immigration to fill the workforce. Because if you get mass amounts of immigration from other cultures, then these cultures, as much as we would like them to leave it at the door, and as much as we could try and legislate that, a lot of the times they don't leave it at the door. And we're seeing this. The problem is not their culture. The problem is our culture. The problem is our unwillingness to stand by our culture. The problem is our unwillingness to defend our culture. If we had done to Islamist jihadist culture after 9-11 what they deserve to be done to them, if we had stood up uh, in, in self-defense, 
and declared their culture to be barbaric and primitive, we wouldn't have this problem today. Uh, and, you know, the idea of encouraging people to have babies is so perverse. God, I mean, there's so many parents out there that I hope never have babies because they're horrible human beings and will make horrible parents. And the kids that they raise will be horrible human beings as well. And yet I don't want the government to decide who should have parents and who should be parents and who should not. I want the government to stay out of it completely. Individuals should decide whether they want to be parents or not. It's it's very simple. We either believe in freedom or we don't believe in freedom. And if you believe in freedom, then the government has no business incentivizing kids or not incentivizing kids. Just leave people alone. Now, to the extent that the people who have influence over this help us create a good culture, a, 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 a culture that people love living in, I think they will have kids. But if they don't, they don't. You know, what's important is your life, your kid's life that you can imagine. Beyond that, I have to repeat, who cares, right? You, 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 you can't project that far into the future. You don't know what the situation is going to be. And, it, it, you know, for, to really get demographic collapse, we're talking about many generations. You, you, the population of the world is not going to go to zero, uh, you know, in, in the foreseeable or unforeseeable future. So just it, we need to calm down about birth rates. We need to just have the kids that we want to have, be concerned about our own happiness and our own prosperity, stop worrying about this civilizational issue. What really matters, what really matters are ideas, what really matters is whether we embrace capitalism or not. And uh, the way to make sure that these Muslim immigrants are not destructive is one, stand up against Islam where it counts, including on the battlefield, and two, stand up for Western values. You know, there would be a lot less problems in England with Muslims if when those, um, you know, rape gangs in parts of England who were that were Muslim were all put in jail and the keys thrown away if the police had actually enforced the laws. The problem is that the police were intimidated. They didn't want to oh, offend the Muslims. So let's enforce the laws, the laws as they are dictated by Western civilization. And, and let's insist that whoever immigrates into our countries follows those laws. I don't think you'll have a problem once you do that. You know, for example, right now in, in London, it, if the police will not enforce the right of, let's say, somebody who's Jewish walking in the streets, if they won't enforce his right just to do that because they don't want to they don't want to get entangled with the Muslim protesters, that's the problem. The problem is the police won't stand up for the rights of individuals and they are letting the thugs uh, win. And once you let the thugs win, guess what happens? More thugs are created. Right in incentivize the creation of more thugs. So what you need to do is stand up to the thugs, stand up to the to the bullies. No, I think we can definitely find some common ground there about the grooming gangs. They should absolutely have the keys thrown away without a shadow of a doubt. Can I try and extend one more olive branch here? You sure. said uh, before that you think that one of the biggest problems that we have is pessimism. I would agree with that. I think that people thinking that we're the world's going to end in eight years is a massive problem, and. I would say that we need to try and encourage more positivity about the West, about ideas such as capitalism and about the founding uh, of the countries that have literally built the world we live in so that people can be more optimistic and want to have children so that we don't have a falling birth rate. Fine. I mean, I don't want to do it so that people have kids. I don't care if you have kids or not. That's your business, not mine. Uh, and as I said, there are certain people who I don't think should have kids. Uh, and so I, I, I prefer to leave it to them and, and, and make it expensive so that if you're going to have kids, then commit. Make sure you do it and do a good job at it. Um, but yes, look, at the end of the day, everything is about ideas. The world is shaped by ideas, not by demographics, not by geography. And by the way, the only country that was actually founded is the United States. The rest of the countries just happen to be around, sitting around there, and have benefited enormously from the founding of America. But um, mm. the uh, you know, let's stand up for the ideas that made the West successful. Let's the capitalism, individual rights, liberty more broadly. Uh, you know, the idea of reason and individualism and political freedom, those are the ideas that made the West what it is. There is no West without reason, individualism and political liberty. Uh, and if we can stand up to those ideas, the rest becomes irrelevant. Uh, I think that breeds a very positive, optimistic culture. I think a side effect of that is people will have more kids. But I think a side effect of that also is more immigrants, that I think you get both. Uh, because I don't want to open immigration up because I want to help the economy. 
I want to open immigration up because I think people should have a right to move where they want to move. And, and uh, I hate the idea that they are very talented, very conscientious, very good people stuck because of complete bad luck in some society where they cannot live up to their potential that, you know, you happen to be born in Afghanistan. So you're stuck living in Afghanistan. That's horrible. I, you know, it would be cool if the better people in Afghanistan could get out and, and, and come to a place where they can live a better life and have mm. kids. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we talk a lot about like positive, uh, pessimism and optimism. And in terms of capitalism itself, I'm trying to think about the future of this because I'm no expert on this by any means. So this is why I love to talk to you about this sort of thing. Um, with the future of this, do you think that it lies in education or it lies in media politics? How do we get people to be more positive when it comes to the ideas of capitalism and embracing this and not seeing it as some sort of evil? It's all about education. It's, it's ed I mean, education in the broad sense education in terms of formal education, but also in the broad sense of educating people. It's all about ed education. It's all about ideas. I mean, politics is downstream from culture and culture is downstream from education and, and, and philosophy, ideas. And, and what we need are better ideas. And then what you need are intellectuals and teachers articulating those ideas in the public. And slowly the culture will change and, and embrace. I mean, it, you know, Margaret Thatcher wasn't elected by accident, right? I mean, uh, the, the, the United Kingdom was heading down this slope of uh, socialism. It was horrible. Both the Conservative Party and the, and the, and the uh, Labour Party were both basically socialist parties at that point. And it was getting ugly and it was getting bad and the economy was shattered. Uh, but in the background, there were people advocating for different ideas that, you know, she was heavily influenced by Hayek. There were think tanks. There were people talking about this. There were books out there. There was Ayn Rand. There was Mises. There were others who were who were changing kind of the tone of the culture and saying there's a different way. There's an alternative. We should try capitalism. That's how we got rich. Maybe we can get rich again using capitalism. And in spite of the fact that I know in the UK, Thatcher is still considered negatively, she changed that country completely. And she made it so much better. I remember England, London in the 70s. And London is such a better place mm. today. In spite of the Muslim population, London is a thousand times better now than it was in the 1970s. 1970s, it was dirty. It was horrible. It, you know, the, the stores were, you know, were very mediocre. Uh, customer service was non-existent. You walked into a store in London and they would go, what do you want? I mean, and, and you know, there was no customer. The Brits are pretty grumpy, to be fair, you know. It was very grumpy. The British, but they were much grumpier back then than they were, yeah. let's say, in the 90s and 2000s. I think they're back mm. to be grumpy because of, of, of you know, the disaster the Conservative Party has turned out to be. But I, yep. I, for a while there, they were actually kind of pleasant. Uh, you, which mm. is, you, you don't quite an improvement. Maybe they were having more kids as they were pleasant and now they're having less because they're grumpy again. But um, so, the, so uh, you know, so I think what you need is that. What you need is laying the ideological foundation for uh, a change and, and education, education, education. And it's very difficult because people like MAGA, uh, the, the, the whole populist movement, and the left as well are all much better in a sense that they appeal to emotion. They just get people riled up. They get people excited. They use fear. They use fear very well, right? I mean, uh, the left uses fear of climate change or the, the MAGA people use fear of World War Three, or use fear of declining birth rates or use fear of uh, the Chinese are taking our jobs, the immigrants are, are destroying our country. So uh, the, the left and right are very good at using fear. And capitalism, those of us trying to educate the world about capitalism, we're not about fear. We're about like, let's make the world a better place. Let's 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 improve human life. Let's make things better and, and make things great. And and that's it, it's sad, but the reality is that is not a message that uh, our culture seems open to right now. They mm. want to be fearful. Yeah. They, they want they want to be afraid. Well, there's something there's something that's uh, intoxicating about fear sometimes. I think. Yeah. Um, so, you're, I want to get your take on the election that's coming up in the United States. I want to go out on a whim here and say I might be completely wrong about this, but I want to say that you might be a Ron Paul guy. No, no, you weren't a part of the whole libertarian thing. No, certainly no? not Ron Paul. Yeah. No. Who do you, who do you like in this coming cycle? Nobody. Literally nobody. 
no, this is, this is, I, I mean, it just, every cycle I think can't get any worse than this. And every cycle that gets worse than it was before. It, there's literally nobody. This cycle is horrible. You've got three, you've got two statists running against each other, both old men. Uh, you know, one is basically half senile and barely knows what he's doing and is, is now, uh, you know, basically, uh, get, uh, you know, handing the keys over to the far left uh, in order. In, so, so the other one is a is somebody who is uh, instinctively and, and in every kind of sense, an authoritarian, believes in nothing uh, except in getting attention uh, to himself, uh, a complete narcissist and uh, uh, not particularly smart uh, economically, has the economic IQ of a of a third grader? Uh, that's Trump, uh, and so you know that is that is the that is the two options that we have. And then you have RFK, who just the day before yesterday said that a, that a parasite had eaten part of his brain, and I mean he literally said this. I'm not making this up, and I believe it completely, given <laughs> you know given that again he, he the guys just these people are not smart. All three of them are not smart, they don't know what they're doing, they have no clue about what made America great, they have no clue about what the founding fathers stood for, they have no clue about capitalism, they have no clue about foreign policy, they have no foreign policy strategy, any of them. And it's a complete and utter disaster. And the sad thing is that if you ask me, okay, who's in the wings, right, in the periphery, who could replace them? I, I mean, the, the people who were decent 10 years ago have all become brainless, MAGA, you know, nobody's. I mean, there used to be a contingent within the, the Senate that I thought, okay, they're like five or six senators who are really good. They're pro free markets. They get the principles. They they can cite the founding fathers. They they get the ideas. They they're pro individual rights. And God, over the last five six years, they've all one after the other, you know, basically uh, given up on all of those ideas and turned status. Every single one of them. So. I just don't, the, the, and, the, and the reason there's nobody in the wings is because the Americans don't want them, right? Mm. America has become a status country. It's abandoned its founding principles. It's abandoned the ideas of, I mean, and, and it, it, you know, America doesn't like woke. And it, so it's rejected the far left. But in terms of what it likes, it has no clue. And it's it's kind of somewhere between centrist, leave us alone types and MAGA, yeah, all right, so somebody, and maybe, mainly Americans are pro-MAGA because they hate the left so much so they'll vote for this. But, but there, there's, no, there's no coherent alternative ideology and no, there are no leaders. There's just no political leadership out there. I mean, and the Republicans, I preferred Nikki Haley to the rest of them, but I mean, again, she wasn't, she was not afraid. What is it about Nikki Haley that you, that you like particularly? She wasn't afraid of using the word capitalism. I thought that was, I mean, she wrote up ads about capitalism. Now, I don't think she understood what it was, but at least she wasn't afraid of using the word. Nobody else talks about capitalism. And, you know, she at least had a semblance of an idea about foreign policy. She was, she had some idea about it. Um, you know, Trump is clueless when it comes to foreign policy and Biden is clueless when it comes to foreign policy. And I think Bush was, and I think Obama was, and I think they all were. I think Dickie Haley has some principles and some ideas and she seems to be willing to stand by them again I, i'm not excited about her but given the field it's it's better than the alternatives do you think that uh, nikki haley is smarter than vivek ramaswamy um vivek is probably smarter there's no question vivek is probably off the charts smart but uh but vivek is clueless right you can be smart and clueless uh vivek vivek wants to be liked I mean, he reminds me of Trump. He's a, he's a kind of a, uh, a bit of a narcissist. He wants to be liked. Uh, he, he wants to get the populist group. So he, he latches onto ideas, you know, uh, that, are, that are basically crazy. Uh, yeah, the, the way to solve the drug war is to intensify it. That, that's the way to solve the drug war. We should invade Mexico, right? We should go to war with Mexico to solve the drug war. When has that ever helped? When has when has a war in an inanimate object like drugs ever solved a problem? It's it, you know, it, it, shouldn't we? We should have learned from prohibition that you don't solve the mafia problem by having more prohibition. You solve the problem of organized crime by making things legal, not by mm. by doubling up and making things illegal. 
Uh, yeah, I more- agree with you about that point about Vivek in terms of uh, the Mexico thing. That was a bit strange and eyebrow raising. But I really would have thought that you would have been a bit more favorable towards Vivek because he is a business guy. He's had a big uh, pharma company and he seems to have done well in the, as, as a capitalist himself. Should've but what stayed- is it exactly that you don't like about him? Should have stayed in business. I mean, he's really good in business. Uh, he has, you know, I think his farm policy across the board was awful. Um, he, 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 he figured that in order to kind of outflank um, Trump from the right, he would have to be, you know, even more pro-Russia and, you know, and, and, uh, uh, then, and more anti-China than even Trump was. Um, so foreign policy was terrible. And domestic issues, he was all over the place. Some stuff I loved, right? When he said, I'm going to fire half the bureaucrats in Washington or whatever. Cool. I'm all for that. Mm. Um, but half of it was completely nutty. So, uh, he, he was this mixture of tr- he, he seemed like he was trying to he was trying to cultivate the MAGA, but didn't quite get that they were actually statist. So he had still some elements of free markets in his thinking. Um, but but no, he was he was incoherent. He didn't have a coherent political philosophy. I wish he had. I, okay. would, I, I was, you know, when he first announced, he seemed interesting and he's super articulate, super charismatic. I did hmm. find it. I don't know if you saw this clip yesterday of uh, him um, interviewing um, Ann Coulter. Ann Coulter. Yep. And the first yep. thing she tells him, the first thing she tells him on the interview is, I really agreed with you on a lot of things, but I would have never voted for you because you're an Indian. So right off the bat, Ann Coulter comes out as a racist. I, I, that was amazing. I mean, um, I, it, it was perfect. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot to like about v- Vivek, but a lot to not like about him. And I found him to be his sucking up to Trump, uh, his sucking up to MAGA generally, uh, hmm. just unpleasant and bad form and unappealing. Um yeah, you That's know, interesting. It's maybe true. we'll get I'll, a I'll, one day that is that is more like uh uh, you know, I, I'm I'm a I'm a fan right now. Millet's. I don't agree. I was, gonna, with I was literally just going to say that. I was I was going to say you. I, my next guess was going to be Javier Millet. Do you yeah, like I him because he's I, I, a to the bureaucracy? I'm a fan of Millet because yeah. I, I mean I disagree with him on some things like like abortion. He claims to be an anarcho capitalist. I'm not a I'm not an anarchist. Uh, and and he, and he's got another uh, set of ideas that I think are, are, are crazy. But here's a guy who knows economics. I mean, he knows economics. He knows what needs to be done. He he, he he seems like he's willing to do it, which takes a lot of courage, particularly in Argentina. Um, he's also got a good foreign policy, right? I mean, the first thing Argentina he did was saying, no, I'm not joining BRICS. I'm with the West. I like the United States. I like Europe. I prefer them to Russia and China and, and all in Saudi Arabia. I'm not joining BRICS. And then, then, uh, then you know, he's, he's supportive of Ukraine, which I think is certainly the right stance to take. Uh, he's supportive of Israel, which is unusual for a libertarian. A lot, most libertarians are anti-Israel. Um, I give him a lot of credit. I mean, he is a, he is a guy who knows, he's real capitalist, knows economics, and has a really good foreign policy. Uh, probably, the, from a foreign policy perspective, maybe the best leader right now in the world. Uh, and um, is willing to go to the World Economic Forum and lecture them uh, against collectivism. I mean, good for him. Uh, I'm not sure he has the proper grasp of what individualism is, but he has a better grasp than most of the people out there, so good for him. Hmm. Now, just on this topic, if you had to give me an avatar, if you could create an avatar of your perfect candidate for 2028, they've got their own party, maybe it can be the Ayn Rand party or the, <laughs> what's the uh, Ayn Rand philosophy again? I just, objectivism, the objectivist party or something like that. What, what would they look like? We call it the capitalist party. Boom, like it. Yeah, and if somebody wants to Google capitalist party USA, you can find, you can find their, um, uh, founding document, the kind of their uh, their policy statement, which I agree with completely. Um, it is, um, it, you know, they don't run any candidates because the support for the capitalist party, I don't know, is five people maybe. Uh, it, you know, maybe it's a few thousand, but it's not very large. So it exists. I mean, there, there are people who th- have thought about this and put it in writing and put it into a document. And it basically is, Right. What, what do we need to do? We need to we need to get rid of regulations. We need to get rid of the regulatory agencies. We need to get rid of all cronyism, and you do that by eliminating regulations, but also 
eliminate all subsidies, lower the corporate tax rate to zero. If there's a corporate tax rate of zero, there's nothing to deduct from taxes. So people don't have to mm. argue about what's deductible or what's not. Just make it make it zero at the corporate level. Uh, a, f- a flat, low tax in the United States. Uh, you know, all corporate welfare is zero. And then start phasing out entitlements and start phasing out the welfare state, you know, uh, slowly, because people have become dependent on it. And you don't want to just throw them off a cliff. So you slowly phase it out, maybe over a generation or two. Um, but the f- key focus should be on getting rid of regulations, simplifying and re- lowering taxes. And the primary focus is cutting, dramatically cutting government spending. And then on foreign policy, the only thing that the U.S. government should be interested in when it comes to foreign policy is protecting American lives and property. And uh, or we, but orienting the foreign policy towards that, towards that and securing trade, really, uh, you know, uh, facilitating global trade. And then, but if somebody violates the rights of Americans, crush them. I mean, just destroy them. That is uh, none of this, uh, you know, wishy-washy, we're building democracies around the world. You kill Americans, you're dead, right? And, uh, and that should be the foreign policy stance. You know what will happen? They'll stop killing Americans very quickly, and they'll stop interfering, and they'll stop stopping trade. You know, these Houthis who are stopping trade in the Red Sea, I mean, if America had a proper response within 24 hours, it would be over. It would be done, and uh, the Houthis would stop. So, uh, you know, that's the foreign policy that, you would, uh, that, I, that I would suggest. Uh, and, a, and a domestic policy, the base. Oh, you know, uh, uh, you know, it, it would be preserve a woman's right to an abortion. Uh, it would preserve people's right to have contracts, including marriage contracts, with whoever the frigging they want to have uh, a marriage with. Get the state out of my bedroom. Get the state out of my body. Uh, get rid of the FDA. Allow you know, allow for uh, uh, private uh, agencies to come about. Private. Uh, to uh, rate and uh, give us safety reports on various drugs, uh, liberate the pharmaceutical companies to actually extend human life and to improve human health dramatically. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you would you would have, I, I think the United States, which today grows at maybe one, two, sometimes 2% growth, maybe on occasion three, but usually closer to two. You could have 6% growth in America. And 6% growth in America is unimaginable mm. in terms of the improvement of human life. You, you, basically, you wipe out poverty w- within a generation, you, you know, within two generations, nobody is making them le- less than six figures in real terms. Mm. Yeah, and Brooke, this has been absolutely fascinating. I've been looking forward to this for a while. I'm so glad you came on the channel. Absolutely, looking forward to sharing it. Um, if you don't mind telling everybody where they can find you, where they can find your books and everything, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've got a website, youronbookshow.com. Uh, they can also uh, find me on YouTube, uh, where most of my uh, most of my commentary is on. I, I also uh, I'm on Facebook. Just put my name in. Not Facebook. I hate Facebook. On Twitter, where you can uh, easily find me. Just yeah, just Google. Just uh, search my name, and then uh, my books. I've got a, a number of books that are all available on Amazon. Uh, just put your own book on Amazon. Our equal is unfair, free market revolution. And uh, the mo- latest book is a mall case for finance, um, the in pursuit of wealth. So, uh, uh, you know, the books are easy, uh, easy to find. But yeah, the, the, the place where there's most a- activity is on, uh, is on uh, YouTube or on uh, any podcasting app. And I, uh, I'll link all of those below. And also, I'm going to be hosting debates on this channel at some point. So if, if you ever wanted to jump on and debate uh, your ideas, then we could get you an interlocutor. Yeah, do it. I mean, I'm, I'm always happy to debate. And if we debates generate a big audience, which is good. So uh, mm-hmm. I, I'll pretty much debate any topic. So uh, fantastic. Uh, it's music to my ears. Somebody to debate against me and, uh, and we'll go at it. It should be fun. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, Ron. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye.